Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fifth Sunday in Lent, which falls on March 26, 2023, are from Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 through 14. Psalm 130 is the psalm for the day. The second reading is Romans chapter 8, 6 through 11. And the gospel reading is John 11, 1 through 45, Jesus' final seventh sign in the gospel of John. And it is the raising of his very good friend, Lazarus. So this is another ginormous text <laughs> in in John uh, and the question is where you drop in I think in terms of what uh, what resonates with you and your preaching I want to say one thing well maybe a couple other things but one thing to get us started and I and I did this last week with John 9 of the necessity of reading forward uh, and and seeing how John 10 of course is the is the discourse Jesus discourse that interprets the sign uh, what we get here is a reversal of that pattern in John I've talked about this before where the actually the dialogue and the discourse happen prior to the sign because the sign itself can be misinterpreted and is indeed misinterpreted by uh, Martha and but since this is the last sign, it can't be. And so this resurrection and the life that the commentary talks about, um, that, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, you really have to look forward to John 12 to see what Jesus means by that. What does life mean? And that the resurrection is awesome, great, fabulous, wonderful. But at the end of the day, it is the penultimate for John, that the ultimate uh, reality to which uh, we are invited in this relationship with Jesus is life abundant that we got in chapter 10, verse 10. And that life abundant for Lazarus is looks like what happens in chapter 12, where he is reclining on Jesus at the table in that, in that intimate, uh, intimate, close relationship with Jesus, which is the promise of the Ascension in John. And so uh, I think that's an important I, theological idea as we get ready for uh, as we get ready for uh, Holy Holy Week and even into Easter, that the promise of the resurrection actually goes beyond the resurrection. <laughs> that uh, that what what Jesus is imagining for us and in his own resurrection is yes, the promise of our resurrection, but a kind of life that's lived uh, in resurrected life, a kind of life that's lived knowing and, and, and reclining into this belonging with Jesus. That's what resurrection makes possible. And so that resurrection is not just this future uh, reality, but is indeed has uh, has everything to do with uh, how we are in our in our present, and so uh, that might be something that the preacher could consider. That's my first thing. I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll I'll piggyback on that to 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 uh, say yes, thank you, and uh, particularly that this knowing uh, of of. That, that Jesus talks about in the in the prayer uh, in in John seventeen three that this is life eternal to know God and the one whom you have sent this this, this knowing is um, really highlighted in chapter twelve as you just said that what does Lazarus do Lazarus doesn't say hey I've got another shot at making my business better I've got another shot at spending time with my loved ones I got another shot at you know getting up my golf game it's like I got an opportunity to spend time with God in the flesh and I'm going to linger there and 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 so if if our if our encounter with Jesus to use your words, Matt, from last week, is just cognitive, and I go on with life as usual, we've missed it. Because the whole problem with humanity is our desire to go on 
in life as if God doesn't exist or as if God doesn't matter. And if God does exist, then God is all that matters. And being close to God sets us to see the glory of God. And that glory is not just um, the uh, transfiguration, but the, that glory is the beauty of creation. That glory is the wonder of humanity who is fearfully and wonderfully made. That, that, that glory is being in community with one another where we get to see God in flesh in one another. And so it comes full circle that everything we are doing is knowing God because Jesus rose from the grave. I think it's valuable to look ahead to see what this, what you're talking about, Joy, how it affects other people as well. And so you've got uh, in chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, the, the leadership wants to put Jesus to death precisely because of this sign that there's something so offensive or so dangerous about this. They want to kill Lazarus as well, Ooh. again, um, poor guy, because he he's this uh, living, breathing, walking reminder, I think, of, of this new life. But then also in 1217, people can't stop talking about it. They continue to keep bearing witness to this, that there's something about this particular sign that just blows the lid off of everything for, for people who, uh, who are involved or who are scared or who are excited. So and there's just so much in this passage as well. Um, I, I think too, you know, that we're three years after the the beginning of the pandemic, which is a time of so much fear and lockdown and and death. Uh, you know, three years ago, when we're hearing this text, uh, people were dying and they were dying alone for the most part. They were dying in in hospitals. Uh, where there were no guests allowed at all. They were saying goodbye to family on iPads that nurses were holding for them. Um, so there's, there are congregations with, with people who continue to have, hold those memories. And so the, the fact that both Martha and Mary, uh, I think there's two of them, uh, both Martha and Mary say, if you had been here, my brother would not have died is, is such an honest, statement of fact <laughs> that is also lament mm -hmm. and also accusation at some level, mm -hmm. but also a statement that doesn't quite know the full range of what's going on. Right? Mm -hmm. It does reflect a confusion, but it's so honest. And so even the way Jesus answers back uh, in the first case uh, to Martha is, I mean, watch how you read that, I think. I think that's gentle. Very. It can be read as yeah. a foolish woman. How do you know? I mean, you can read it as sternly yeah. and, and wrongly, I think, but I don't think that's consistent with you. It takes us into grief. As I said, what I'm trying to say, this passage has the potential to help us explore some of those really difficult questions if we want to. Well, and I, th yeah, and that's an important point because what's so interesting about the passage is the, the narrative space that is given to questions of grief and expressions of grief. Mm -hmm the narrative space of the actual raising of Lazarus is two verses. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the chapter is, is, is the experience of, and the, and as I said, the expressions of grief around death and even Jesus own uh, expression of grief is important. I think to focus on, especially as we imagine, as we recognize that this is the last Sunday of Lent and we move into Palm Sunday and Holy week, you know, why does Jesus weep here? Uh, he weeps, I think, for Lazarus because his friend is dead and Lazarus is his friend. He weeps for his uh, dear, uh, his dear friends, Martha and Mary and their loss. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent? Because then, you know, the very next chapter will be his anointing and then his triumphal enter, entry in Jerusalem. To what extent he weeps for himself and mm -hmm. that he knows what's what's ahead. And there's and that's what has to be. And which is why Mary's anointing of him is so powerful and uh, and so important that he carries her expression of love uh, with him through all of it. And so he weeps for himself, but I also think he weeps because he cannot take death away. He can't. 
I, that's, that's what it means to be an incarnate person. I, incarnate is what it means to be human is everything that is incarnate must die. And he cannot take that away. And so how is it that a preacher might talk about that? That this, these are, this is that when Jesus weeps, the, the fullness of what death does and what death takes away. Uh, is present in his um, in his tears, and uh, and and it's and it's for what he's experiencing, as I said, in that moment. But what will come? But also knowing that he can't take it away. And um, uh, for me, that was re- that's been really powerful to think about that um, that that's that that Jesus' tears are for me as well. Um, and know, knowing that he can't take away my pain, can't take away my grief and my loss, but he knows it. And that there's something deeply, deeply comforting in that. The knowing that it's not dismissive, which again, um, mm-hmm. as Matt was saying, take care in how you read this passage, because this 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 is a, a, a lengthy story about um the full care of Jesus displayed among his friends, um, publicly displayed among his friends. So, you know, he didn't go off, he didn't go off by himself for this one. Um, everybody got to see what he was experiencing. Um, and I, I want to just say this, um, This is one of those times where I'm grateful to be a Wesleyan and not a Lutheran because I can take time with this text. Uh, It's a long passage, but Caroline, as you said, you know, the the length of this passage is that this is a description of what is happening, not an announcement of the resurrection of Lazarus. You know, in some ways, that's what happens. There's this little announcement here, but the setup and the recognition of the fullness of the circumstance is what the passage spends all of its time on. And uh, for us to be able to take the time with the, with the passage to do that is how you draw folks in. If all we do is tell them, this is what this means, and this is what you should understand, and this is what you should take away, I'm going to forget that. But if you do what this text and so much of scripture does is if you narrate it, if you tell the story, if you paint the scene, if you live in the emotions, then folks are going to remember it. And what they, what is the final point that you lead them to is going to be not because you told them, but because they've experienced it. Mm -hmm. And that's when the text becomes a living word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so much more uh, that I could say on that. I mean, yeah, like the whole Lazarus come out and Jesus will call you by name. He knows my sheep by name, but you know, I've said that a hundred times. So anyway. I I will put in this little snappy statement uh, for anybody who wants to take a little edge on there is um, uh, following what you said, uh, Caroline, that Jesus wept knowing his own death was coming. It's sort of like, okay, when I do this, this is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. They are going to be furious with this one. And I know what's going to happen next. The other way to to kind of look at that is this. You think that if Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead, killing Jesus might not be the way to stop him. (laughs) Well, I would say people in power have a limited amount of tools in their toolbox and they tend to they tend to um, they tend to keep going back to those same tools. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a great point. <laughs> so Ezekiel's fun cuz well, it's just such a, a a visceral passage, but of course read it in context that this isn't this is an, an exilic vision where people thought they were totally cut off uh from the power of God, right? God was back in in Judah and they're mm-hmm. stuck out in exile. But here's this image of God coming in and revivifying the nation in its death or through its death or in spite of its apparent death and, and, and bringing new life back to it where they, where they are, which, 
which probably means something really different to us uh, after the last three years. It, it, I think it also, I'll keep, I'll keep beating my drum about, you know, these are good texts to think about congregational values, congregational history, where, where, when were there times where your congregation thought it was utterly cut off from God's restorative power and God surprised you in some way, shape or form in the past, or how is that still happening? Not as a kind of easy promise to throw around that everything will always get better, uh, but to find to find in your institutional memory, in your communal memory, your familial memory, ways in which uh, you, somebody somewhere stood up or God just showed up and said, no, this isn't quite the end. Yeah, and I, I think too, with this Ezekiel passage is that it helps to remind us that I mean, it, with the with the context right of 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 the exile and and the promises that that are shared by uh, by this prophet to uh, to to the people in exile that uh, that life will happen again. I think it also is a good reminder with regard to how we talk about resurrection uh, and what does it mean to to live as with the promise of the resurrection and is that it's not just a personal or individual reality, but a, a call to uh, a, a, that, that our God is a God that brings new life and, uh, and resurrected life. And, and that, and how is it that, how do we actually live like that? And, and how do we live with that promise uh, that is ever before us? Uh, and, and that God's, you know, God's very breath is the one that is what enlivens us. Um, of course, there are many connections here to <laughs> to John, uh, which which is not. I mean, we'll get we won't get until after Easter. But the the verb of breathing into the dry bones is the same verb that John will use for. Uh, Jesus breathing the spirit breathing into the disciples and it's the same verb that's used in Genesis 2 7 mm -hmm. and so that that uh, we imagine that this resurrected life is or that which brings life back is um, is actually is actually this breath of God that has this kind of you know this kind of um, enlivening power and brings brings death to life and that's that could be another maybe connection that you could go with with this passage absolutely and if you're reading the um the gospel text as your focus i think finding a way to echo this uh ezekiel passage which would have been one of the familiar stories for first century jews to know and all of a sudden they're seeing it happen again uh, in, in this one individual. Um, and as you said, Caroline, and, and those very, that very language will be used again um, uh, uh, for us not to lose sense of the continuity of the story. Um, but also in reverse, uh, and I get in trouble for this uh, every once in a while, but I like to preach Christianly, which means I like to preach the Old Testament knowing how the story ends. The Old Testament for me is always a second reading. And so when I'm talking about how the people in the Old Testament are hearing this for the first time or reading this for the first time or experiencing this, then I don't wanna bring Jesus in. But when I'm reading this text as a Christian, I do want to acknowledge the fact that it's a setup for what God is always going to be doing, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so that one way of reading this Ezekiel text is to see that God is not done with, as you said, Caroline, bringing life out of things that have no life. Psalm 130 contextualizes that so well, right? By avoiding the rush, um, also the, mm -hmm. the the rhetoric of this is is beautiful. When you get to verses five and six with the repetition, you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, if the psalmist wanted to make his point more economically, uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, they could have, but instead this idea of waiting and watching mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is hard work. It's hard to do alone. Uh, it's hard to do even when you've got fellow waiters and watchers uh, with you. Um, maybe that's part of the agony that that Martha and Mary are experiencing. Mm-hmm. Look at this. I'm going back to John. That uh, why should we have had to wait for this? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, why should we have had to wait? Jesus deliberately delays in that story yes. for reasons that are never explained. Yeah. Uh, but seem cruel. Uh, on the outside or seem uncaring. And well, I don't have to explain this uh, to the both of you, right? I mean, grief is like that. You know, sometimes it's long, it's hard, it's slow. And sometimes it leads you into places where you think I've been cheated here, right? Or this didn't happen in, in a way that, uh, that seems consistent with, with God's graciousness and love. Mm-hmm. And yet, uh, as you began uh, your comments, this context, this verse contextual, these verses contextualize it, and and be without just a sense of rush to the promise. This says no. The reality is the promise is what enables me to wait. The promise is what enables me to have hope. The promise and the faithfulness of God is what allows me to be able to be honest and say, I beg you, God, hear me. I am crying from the depths of my heart. I I don't have to act like, I'm just gonna trust, I'm just gonna trust. God invites me through all of these texts to linger in the honesty of lament with hope because when when that time that season of lament is over when that promise is realized i'm going to better appreciate it because i've lived without because i've experienced pain and grief and sometimes we have to allow folks to take us on that journey if we're not living it at ourselves you know uh sometimes we're like well i can't understand because i've never suffered in that way What that says to me is that you've never walked with someone you care about who suffered in that way. So allow the experience of others to let you linger. Don't just take your joy, your, your, um, your celebration and say, Oh, everything's going to be all right. Wait, linger, lament, journey with along the, the rough side of the mountain. I would, I would, uh, even, you know, I talk about using the psalm liturgically and, and frequently. And there are, I think there are so many places that you could put the psalm this for this this uh, Sunday, and maybe just invite the preacher to imagine where that where it could go. I I think of it as even like a not even almost like a dismissal or, or not, not a blessing, but it, that's the wrong word for both of them. But, but just that, because now we're going into waiting mm-hmm. uh, with, with Palm Sunday and, and Holy Week. And so that we, that we allow people to, or that we invite people to, uh, to name that or to say out of the depths, I cry to you. And now we move together into this waiting period. Uh, I would, I would wonder if that might work. So just an idea. That's, that's great. That's great. Romans, back to Romans. Yeah. And in the context of everything that we've been talking about, there is this sense of the promise of in the midst of death, we have the spirit Um, in in the context of, of the verses that we've looked at already. um, There is a place for, uh, a continuity of the message being read in Romans. Um, of course, we're probably going to spend some time doing Romans by itself, um, but I just want to put it in the, con- I want to invite folks to also recognize it can be read in this context of um, we're not going to be, have the mind of death um, because we have this promise. But Romans is, it, 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 it in this very chapter, it's about the very creation waiting. 
And it's bold. I mean, Paul is is rather unambiguous in verse nine. You're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit, mm -hmm. since the spirit of God dwells in you. And there the spirit is is capitalized by the translators because I think it's very widely assumed he's talking about the Holy Spirit here and contrasting that to flesh, which is not our embodied living. You can never say this too much. Paul does not hate uh, the body or, or think that, that real Christian spirituality is about escapism or transcendence. This is flesh means about three or four different things in Paul, depending upon the context. And, and here I think it's this idea of a sinful nature. It's this idea of old patterns and old capitulations to sin. And he says, you're, you're past that. You're beyond that. Now that gets worked out in different denominations, ways of talking about the human creature, which we're probably not going to settle today um, in our three different traditions, but, but here's, unless you want to, we're going to need more time. Uh, we'll do a bonus episode one day. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but to explore that, uh, to explore, what that means to live in flesh as a good thing uh, imbued by the spirit of God is a statement that I think gets back to, I'm going to do this again. We're going to jump back to John gets to this whole idea of incarnation, Caroline, and the way you were talking about incarnation and our own uh, corruptibility, our own our immortality, mm -hmm. not necessarily being a sign of weakness or failure. No, oh, but who we are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think uh, this is where verse 11, just to recognize that it's not, you know, it's a, it's, it's a condition of fact, not if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, but since mm -hmm. uh, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you or is housed in you is the, is the verb there. And so there, once again, we hear a pro the promise in a new way or in a different way that, God's spirit is, uh, and and God's spirit who brings dry bones back to life, who uh, who breathed breath and and life into Adam, who will show up in the locked room, and this and the disciples will receive that. So since that spirit is um, it dwells in you, uh, what promises are then uh, possible for you? That's. It's not a condition, it's, it's reality.